Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can see me. We had a, a couple of technical issues in the first minute, basically because I didn't know where I needed to be. Um, yeah, so this is my first time giving a, a talk at, at the Polyglot Gathering. I'm, I hope that you know, you're as excited as I am about this. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about what it is like to be in this wonderful linguistic environment uh, with all of these different languages and people so excited to learn languages um, where, um, where you come from a position of being a native English speaker. Um, and the main reason that I got into learning languages was because I felt really trapped by English because everywhere I went, their English was. So, um, so this talk is um, mostly aimed at native English speakers, but if you're not a native English speaker, I would be really interested to hear how many of these things, um, these struggles that I'm going to talk about, you feel trapped by as well, because it's not just a problem that we have. I think it's a problem everybody has. Okay, so, um, right, so, so where did this, where did this start? Um, Right. So, so a few days ago, um, I was I was in a bar, and I met this Italian Polish um, mixed lady who, quite frankly, really irritated me. Um, so, so we started talking about foreign language learning, as often happens, and about native English speakers. And and she said to me, "You need to learn languages. Like you, in general, need to learn languages." She said, "I speak five languages." She goes. Um, and the average number of languages that a European, she said, speaks nowadays is three minimum. They speak their native language, then they speak English, and then they speak another European language minimum. And native English people really need to up their game because they're lagging behind. And then she said, it's ignorant and it's pathetic. Now, this lady had no idea that I'm an active polyglot who studies language learning and, and writes a blog for native English speakers who want to learn foreign languages. And, and I said to her, well, you know what? I have quite a lot of compassion for the situation. To which she replied, and I quote, she said, compassion, that's a strong word. Now, who is with me here? Who calls compassion a strong word? Okay, maybe we might call hate a strong word. We might call war a strong word, but compassion. I just, I, I think it's safe to say that I shan't be talking much with that lady again in future. Okay, so, so why do I have this compassion for the situation? Right, um, I can't actually see the comments. I'd like to ask you what this is, and I hope my, my picture is good enough, but I can't see the comments. Um, so I'm going to see if I can, I can find the, ah, here they are. Okay. Um, yeah. Can anybody tell me in the, in the chat, what, what, what this is, what are we looking at? We are, uh, thank you, Tiffany. It's a magnet. Great. Um, yeah. Okay. So for me, English is like this. English is like this magnet. And so, and so the magnet is, is English itself or the Anglosphere. And, and all of these people are just attracted to it. They're just pulled towards it. Whether you want to learn English or whether you, you don't want to learn English, maybe you need it for economic reasons, or um, maybe maybe people who aren't native speakers, um, they, they, they need it to study, or you know, they're just watching something in a foreign language and they need it for, you know, just on YouTube or they follow some somebody who, who's, who's English, it's just everywhere. And so everybody's drawn to it. But people forget that what if you were born already stuck to that magnet? So you're already there in the first place. Now, if you are stuck to a magnet, it's very easy to get drawn towards it. But if you're there already, how on earth do you get out? And this was my problem. I just felt that English was everywhere and I just felt so stuck. Um, because we have, because everything is, is, is stacked against us. All of the force, the linguistic force in the world is stacked against us. Right. So, so here is, here is the first struggle. I'm going to give you six struggles today. And here is the first one. 
that that okay so perhaps you're a, a native english speaker i'm going to start with some that i think are more geared towards natives and then there are some that i think later on everybody is is probably going to find these struggles as well so the first the first one is that perhaps um right so so maybe you, you're starting learning some other languages or maybe you already speak some other languages at a decent level but you are disheartened and a bit embarrassed I'm not surprised because if we have people in this world who are in the bars who are saying to us, well, you know, English natives, they're just so ignorant. They're linguistically ignorant and it's pathetic. No wonder we're feeling disheartened and embarrassed because um, we see all of these, these non-natives who can speak our language fluently and often other languages too. Um, and yet all we can do is maybe string together a sentence in our native language. And it just feels, it feels pathetic. And I get it, it feels pathetic. And, and maybe you think that that lady from the bar has a point because on this cultural front, native English speakers are this linguistic embarrassment. So, so I'm here to offer some empathy. Why? Because what this lady was missing is that we're very bad at making accurate, fair comparisons with others. And it's, you know, it's never a good idea to compare ourselves with other people. But if we do, if we do, then it seems that we're using screwed, skewed metrics. Because the truth of the matter is, if you were in their situation and you were living their life, then you would have uh, their experiences and exposure to multiple languages too. And you would speak just as many languages as they do. But at least if we're going to compare, you know, abilities to speak foreign languages with that of our non-native counterparts, then we've got to be fair and readjust this metric. And instead of saying, oh, I speak five languages, you know, the lady in the bar, we could instead talk perhaps about linguistic accomplishments. So this is, I'm just going to say as a warning, <laughs> this is not the case for everyone everywhere in the world. Now, this lady was speaking specifically about um, the developed world where, you know, people are quite privileged um, and they've had access to a good education and they're in an area where, you know, perhaps they've got, um, they, they have lots of resources available to them. Okay, so in those kinds of environments, here is a system I've built. If we're going to compare, let's be nice to ourselves to be kind. So, so the, let's talk about like the number of linguistic accomplishments that, that we've achieved, we've accomplished, rather than, oh, how many languages we speak. So, you know, I've been a victim to this as well. So I have a housemate. Um, and when I moved to this house, um, I, um, so I just started learning my fourth language. It was my third foreign language, my fourth language. And um, I was I was just thrilled over the moon that I got to four. And so when people said to me, how many languages do you speak? I could say four. And then I met my housemate and she could speak four languages. And I thought I've devoted so much time and energy. And, you know, I'm active and enthusiastic um, about learning languages. And it's taken me ages to get to four. Um, and you've not devoted any, any effort, um, active effort to, to learning foreign languages. Um, and so I just felt really, I felt really belittled by this. Okay, so the, let's talk now more about the context. Um, right, so, so my housemate um, speaks Bulgarian, fluently she speaks these four, Bulgarian, uh, Spanish, uh, Catalan, Valencian Catalan, and English. Okay, now my housemate's parents immigrated from, um, from Bulgaria to Spain when she was three years old. And she, she's lived in Catalonia on the east coast of Spain. And her parents always spoken to her in Bulgarian because they're a Bulgarian family. And on the east coast of Spain in Catalonia, we have here Spanish and also Catalan. And so she used both every day in all of her schooling and all of her social life. So for all intents and purposes, she, she's native Spanish and Catalan, as well as Bulgarian, because she doesn't have a, even a hint of an accent and she never searches for her expressions and she never makes those kind of non-native grammatical slip ups. And she speaks English as well. So when we take a closer look at what's happened, we have here her four languages 
but she speaks. And then we can say, well, you know, she's actually native in three of those four languages. And then the fourth one is our special kind of oddball that doesn't really operate like Italian, German, Bulgarian, Ukrainian. It's that one that's just, it's everywhere. Um, and that's English. So if we take away our four there, uh, our three native languages, um, so our non-English native languages, and then take away English, um, then, then all we're left with is nothing. We're not left with any, any, any linguistic accomplishments um, in that sense. Now, of course, a reminder that this isn't the case for everyone, and it, it's, a, it's a huge accomplishment for a lot of people in, in a lot of areas of the world to, to learn English to a fluent standard. Um, but it, it doesn't help native English people uh, when, they, when, they, when they look at the metric in, in a way that doesn't fit their context. Okay, um, yeah, so, so maybe you're looking at this today. Maybe this is the first time you're at the polyglot gathering, maybe not. And when I was first at the polyglot gathering, I just spoke English. I could say a few things in Spanish, but I just spoke English. And so I could say, okay, well, maybe I don't have any linguistic accomplishments, but maybe a lot of people don't either in the same, in the same kind of way. Okay, so that's the first struggle. The second struggle is that a lot of native English speakers don't believe that they can actually do it. They don't believe that they actually can learn other languages. Now, why is this going to be the case more for us English people than for, than for foreigners? Um, foreigners meaning non-native speakers of English. Okay, so, so the reason why is, um, is because one of the biggest struggles that stands in our, it stands in our way is that as, as native English speakers, you probably don't have already the experience behind you of fluency in a second language. So you don't know what it feels like necessarily to fluently articulate yourself without your native language or to start seeing the world and, and thinking without that lens of English, because English is all you know. Um, and most likely you, you've studied the language in school. Maybe you've even really enjoyed it. But but because, you know, here you are, perhaps today, um, or at least some point in your life, if you're, if you're a native speaker, still only really able to hold a conversation in, your, in, in English, mm -hmm. your confidence is just shot. It's shot to pieces because you tried, you've studied in school, and you still can't. And yet, if we look over to countries like, well, a lot of European countries, not in the world, um, uh, countries like Portugal, Germany, France, even places like the Philippines, they go through the education system and they get to 18. And at 18, most, most people, even the average student in the class, is fluent in English and they can speak English with relative ease. And, you know, if, if we study French at school and we get to 18, chances of us being able to speak French fluently with ease at 18 in the British education system are so slim. <laughs> Most people cannot do that. Most people come out and they can, they can just say, you know, the items in their pencil case or, or you know, where is the toilet? Or, you know, they, they certainly can't, um, can't go out and live in France and, 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 and yes, do all of those things. So, so I really understand this because what, why would you believe that you can learn foreign languages when you have no evidence, like your, your environment has given you no evidence to believe that that's true? Why would you believe you can do it if all you have is actually evidence of the contrary that you've tried in school and maybe a few times you've tried and to no avail? So, so then when we look at learning other languages that aren't English, so let's say, you know, a French person then decides to go and learn German or Italian or Japanese. They don't face this same hurdle that, that native English speakers face because they already know, at least subconsciously, they already know that they can learn and speak fluently in a foreign and think fluently in a foreign language. Uh, because they're already so good at English. If they can do it in English, why can't I do it in German? Um, so they already know it's possible and they have that confidence and that experience to know how to do it. Right, <clears throat> 
So, so here is a graph, at least for me, this is what my experience is like of learning foreign languages. Getting from your native language to fluency in a first language is a huge, huge step. And anyone who's managed to surpass that, especially with the context that, that native English people have, that is enormous. And once you've seen that you can do it once, the effort to get to a third language and then a fourth and then a fifth just kind of decreases a little bit. So if, you know, on the Y axis here, we should have, um, you know, the, the effort, the difficulty. Um, obviously, it depends on which languages you learn and, you know, how, how dissimilar they are from the languages you already know. You know, if you start out learning Chinese, um, that's probably going to be take a lot more effort than if you start out, you know, learning Spanish from, from, um, from English. Um, but this has certainly been my experience. So um, here's the third struggle. Uh, and then we'll move on to the struggles that that I think more people, even non-natives, are are going to are going to relate to. So people don't understand why you bother learning a language. Now here in the polyglot gathering, we all understand why we bother learning languages because we're all so passionate about it. But outside of this beautiful environment, people just don't get it. <laughs> so. <clears throat> So, okay, so, and this is why, because as soon as you can speak English, regardless of where you're from, regardless of your linguistic background, the world is your oyster. You can travel to other countries, basically any other country in the world, and you can at least function enough with, with English and nothing else, because people will almost always be able to understand you when you speak in your native language. So just about every kind of job opportunity is available to you. You can work internationally, you can make friends internationally, and, and non-natives learn English because it, it opens up all of these social and economic, uh, economic opportunities for them. You know, you can get better jobs, you can have better experiences, and often people learn English because it gives them a higher quality of life for better or worse. Um, but, but for us, you, you know, if, you, if you are a native speaker, then you probably won't get, in the vast majority of cases, you won't get any of those things from learning a foreign language. So what's the point? There's simply no necessity. And necessity is a really big motivator in propelling people's language learning. Um, so when we're a child, you know, we, we learn the, the language of our families because we have to. Um, when, and when there are no employment opportunities in our country besides perhaps, you know, underpaid manual labor, we have to learn another language. But, but you, as a native speaker, don't have any of that. Uh, so unless you're going into a very specific career um, or a very specific field, not only do you really not need another language, but it probably won't even be that useful to you unless you're actively seeking out those kinds of opportunities. So people just don't understand you. So I've watched and been part of many conversations where, where non-natives have said, they've said, oh, I'm learning English or I want to learn English. And, and the reply they get is great. That's, that's such a great idea. You know, it's gonna be so useful in your career, for your life. You know, it's going to open all these doors. You should definitely do that. But when I say to people, oh, you know, I'm going to learn French or, or God forbid, I say to people, I'm learning Esperanto or, yeah, I'm fluent in Esperanto. People say to me, but why? What was the point? Like, you don't need it. What are you doing? And so you don't get encouragement and support from other people. So, <clears throat> so I have friends who are native English. And they grew up speaking English, but they have family heritages of um, Tagalog or Yiddish or Portuguese or Spanish. And yet they don't, they don't speak any of those languages and they feel a bit ashamed about it. Um, and they feel really disconnected from their cultural roots as a result. But it's not your fault. It's not that you're ignorant. It's not that you're pathetic. It's none of these things. It's simply that you're not getting the exposure to the language. And here's what's more, okay? Other people are actually not letting you have it. So these people who are saying to you, oh, but why was I bother learning another language? 
then they are the people who are actually um, probably completely without realizing and um, stopping you from having those opportunities. Um, because the world is so absolutely full to the brim with English, English, English everywhere. Okay, so let's talk about the fourth struggle. Uh, and I think here, um, even non-natives are, are going to relate. <clears throat> so people, so, um, okay. Um, where am I going from here? I've lost my train of thoughts. Uh, okay, so so often people don't realize that the kind of obstacles that you face, half the time, they are creating. Um, so, okay, so, so often people will actively stop you from trying, from practicing your target language. <clears throat> so, uh, again, I cannot count the number of times when I've been abroad and I've been trying to practice the foreign language that I was learning. And, and the person who was speaking to me, so I spoke to them in the target language and they spoke back to me in English. <laughs> now, there are, there are various reasons that this happens. So, so often, if they know that you're a native English speaker, perhaps you're at the airport and they've got your passport or, you know, in some contexts, people know you're a native English speaker. Um, they want to practice their English <laughs> because English is by far the most common second language to learn in the world. So practically everyone you meet will just jump at the opportunity to practice their English. And um, you're just like this, this rare breed to them because it's not only is it someone who's really proficient at English, it's a native English speaker. And, um, and so people just jump at the opportunity. So now other people, native Italians, Portuguese, Bulgarians, Ukrainians, whoever, they don't experience this problem anywhere near as much as, as we do. So you've taken the leap and you've had the, the courage to go out to another country, to their country, to learn and improve your language skills in their language. And as soon as you land, people are dying to speak to you in your native language. Uh, and they're actively stopping you from getting in that process. They're actively stopping you from getting that exposure to, to that foreign tongue. Okay, <clears throat> number five. So not only are they speaking to you in English, but because of this, their English is almost always better than you are at speaking their language. So yeah, so, so not only, a lot of non-native speakers, not only did they have to speak the foreign language when they're abroad, because people won't turn around to them and go, oh, there, there, I'll just speak to you in your native language and save you the hassle. <clears throat> um, in order to be understood when they're abroad, not only do they have to speak the language, but there's usually often quite a lot of, for them, the foreign language, which is English, in their home country anyway. <laughs> so this means that, in whatever country you're in, people might just speak to you in English as a way of trying to be nice um, and just making it easier to communicate because they have so much exposure and exposure to and practice that English <clears throat> that their English is often leaps and bounds ahead of your ability to speak in their language. So we're just making the problem worse. <laughs> um, and, and, and here is, I think, the main reason why. So if you're in this situation and you're trying to speak their language and you're making the effort and you're trying to learn and they say, oh, it's fine, we'll just speak in English. It's, I think that's because people are, we as humans are lazy, right? We're not gonna put in effort if we don't have to. Um, and so, so what do these people do? So what, what do we do? We, we speak to each other in the way that makes communicating easiest. Um, and, and we're trying to be kind. And that is almost always English. So, okay, so uh, this happens with both um, native English speakers and non-native English speakers. <clears throat> now, an example I have is that um, my best friend is native Portuguese and, and I've learned Portuguese. And, and people very naively, um, but understandably say to me, Oh, it must be so easy for you to get practice. It must be. It must have been really easy for you to learn Portuguese because your best friend is is a native speaker. 
um, how lucky you are, right? But in reality, this never happens. Um, in fact, it's, it's actually probably one of the most unlucky things because I have a native speaker of my target language that I can chat with for hundreds of hours every year. And, and yet that opportunity is trapped behind this giant all pervasiveness that is English. Why, right? Why is it trapped? Because it's so much easier for us to talk in English because his English is miles ahead of my Portuguese level. And that's probably never going to change, even if my Portuguese gets really good. And so I'm so we're lazy and we keep speaking in English, which exacerbates the problem because then his English gets better and my Portuguese doesn't. And so, of course, of course, um, my best friend is not is not actively trying to prevent me from learning. He just, he, you know, he wants every success for me in life and he cheers on my progress. But, but people, and you know, people are never trying to be malicious or to knock you down. Instead, we're just being lazy and we're trying to be nice. Um, and we want to communicate with each other freely and just with ease. And we don't want, we don't want to, to struggle when, when the conversation gets, maybe it gets quite intimate or maybe it gets quite technical. Um, and the thing is, when that happens, unfortunately, we know that there is a very simple, effort-free way that we can avoid that struggle. What is it? Switch to English. So even I am trapped in these problems as much as I complain about them. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so here is the final, ah, so ah, this is just a visual representation of this problem. And um, so, so, you know, we want between us the two biggest bars that we can have, the combined, you know, uh, greatest kind of quantity. Um, and so on the left, we have, um, you know, a situation where you're trying to speak to another person in their, you know, where, where someone else is speaking to you and you have the option of speaking in English. Um, that's going to be a lot easier for you because their English is, is really good. Yours is probably better if you're a native speaker, but it, it, their English is really good. And so it's just it's just easy. But in when you're trying to speak in the target language, it, it, it causes this tension because you, you have to force significantly more in a lot of situations. OK, so here is the final struggle that uh, that we face with this all pervasiveness of English. <clears throat> so um, you as an English speaker, as an English native, perhaps um, your native tongue is not just your native tongue. It's also the international language. Now, so if, if we look, look at this very simple table, right? So if you, if you think about Italian, right? On the whole, who speaks Italian, right? On the whole, statistically, Italians speak Italian, right? And where, where is Italian speaker? Speaker, speaker, spoken. Um, it's spoken in Italy, right? And if you, you can take the same with German. German on the whole, who speaks it? Germans speak German in Germany. Russians on the whole, Russians speak Russian in Russia and not a lot of other people, but English. Now, you know, somebody could say, well, you know, English, who speaks English? Well, English, the English speak English, where? In England. No, that, that's not how our world works anymore. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, so English is just the language that everybody speaks now. <clears throat> so it, it's not the language of the English people. Nowadays, English is, for better or worse, is, is the language of the world. Um, so it, it's the international language that we all share. It's not it, in the way that, you know, maybe Italian person could say, oh, Italian is my language. I can't really say that English is my language. It's, it's our language. Um, because uh, no matter which country you're in or where you're from, English is something that you, you share. Um, yeah. So, you know, suppose you go to a different country where, you know, any resident could perhaps take an educated guess that you're not from that country. So perhaps you're, let's say you're white and you're in Japan. 
or maybe maybe you're, you're, you're black British and you're in Poland, or maybe you're of Indian descent and you're in Spain. Um, so, so people don't necessarily know where you're from, but they do know that you're a foreigner, right? And they want to communicate with you, maybe in the street or in a shop or, or wherever, whatever situation. Um, so, so what language do they think you're most likely to understand if they talk to you in? It's going to be English, obviously, because you're probably going to understand the, you know, the international language. Not, not because you're necessarily a native English speaker, even though that makes the problem worse, but because practically everybody understands English. And so maybe if you, I don't know, maybe you're a Polish person who, who has gone to Germany to learn German, and you get there and people realize maybe they know for some reason that you're not German, they're not going to speak to you in Polish. They're going to speak to you in English. <clears throat> so, so okay. So I'm I'm relatively tall, and uh, I don't I don't have brown eyes, um, and you know I have dyed blonde hair. I used to be a lot more blonde, um, and I can't count for some reason the number of times that when I was out in Barcelona traveling there, people literally tried to convince me that I was German. <laughs> so, so people would say, oh, where are you from? You say, oh, you're German, aren't you? Say, no, no, I'm from the UK. They say, no, you're not, you're German, right? And even on the basis of this, this idea that a lot of people thought I was German, they didn't speak to me in German. Nobody ever spoke to me in German, obviously not. No, no, they speak to me in English because practically everybody understands English, right? So, you know, it always used to be really weird to me when, when I see a non-native, my non-native English friends <clears throat> at, at university in the UK um, speaking to each other in English. <clears throat> so I remember once seeing, um, you know, a, a Slovakian friend and a Portuguese friend just chatting away together um, in English. And I thought, this is so weird because I was coming at it from the angle of like, you know, how an Italian worked. If an Italian saw a, um, a Slovakian and a Polish person talking to each other in Italian, it would be really odd. And I was just thinking, what are you doing? What, what, you, why aren't you speaking either Slovakian or, or Portuguese or, you know, maybe Esperanto? Why are you speaking my language? why aren't you speaking to each other? Like, why are you speaking to each other in my native language? I'm not even part of the conversation. So, and, and here's why, because I had this idea that it was my native language, but it, it's not. We can't these days think of it as, you know, your native language. It, it's not like Slovakian or Portuguese or Italian. They're speaking, for them, they're speaking in the international language. And, you know, to them, they've learned that when you're in a different country, when you're speaking to someone from a different country, you need to use this international language. So, <clears throat> is everywhere. English is everywhere. It's everywhere you go. And even if people don't think you're native English, even if you are in any way perceived as slightly foreign or even slightly international, uh, they'll most likely have, you know, English just up their sleeve, ready to pounce on you and hold you back from getting that exposure that you need in order to break out of this bubble of the Anglosphere that, that the world has trapped you in. Right. So, um, I can't get to the next slide. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So the main takeaways from this talk are that, right, nobody realizes it. Often people don't give you credit for this, like our lady in the bar, um, but the odds are really are stacked against you. <clears throat> and it's, it's hard to believe in yourself that you can, you know, if, if you're native, it's hard to believe that you can learn foreign languages to a, to a really high level when, when no one understands what it's like for you and your, your linguistic context and people are constantly stopping you. They're trying to be nice, but they're stopping you. Um, yeah, and the next takeaway is that English, it really isn't like other languages. We can't think of it like, you know, our native language. Um, and you, you don't need to be ashamed or embarrassed at your lack of success with foreign languages, 
because you face struggles that a lot of foreigners, a lot of in, a lot of non-natives, that is, don't don't face. So I'm here. I'm here for you, and I get it. And there is hope. Um, but I think where we've got to start from is a place of self-compassion. Um, yeah. So if you'd like to, if you're interested in, in this and would like to find more about, you know, what I have to say about the matter and get some more kind of practical guidance of how we can go from this place of being trapped in English to, to breaking out of that. Um, I run this blog, um, everything's free. I run this blog um, talking about talking about these kinds of things and, and, and how we can make progress. Yeah, so, so that's the end of my talk. Um, so I'll, I'll move on to the questions now. Um, I think they're being sent through to me. I think that's how it works. Yeah, okay, so uh, the first question I have here <clears throat> is, um, I fully agree with the biggest step um, oh, okay, here, here they are. I fully agree with the biggest step moving from L1 to L2, so our, our first native language to our first foreign language. And I was wondering whether Laura Jane has also experienced the then biggest step from moving on from one language family to the next. Okay, um, I haven't experienced this yet. Um, and I haven't done, I, for me, I haven't done this on purpose because um, I, I was aware that really, for, for a lot of native people, the uh, native English people, the, the battle is is not just um, is not just um, a linguistic one. It's also a psychological one. And so I started with I started learning Spanish um, when I was very young. I started learning Spanish, um, and then once I reached a level in Spanish that that felt like um, at least fluent, um, maybe something near a proficient, um, then I thought, okay. I, I've watched this step. I've, I now know that I can do it. And so from there, I thought, okay, I want to prove this to myself again. So I said, what's the next easiest step? And I said, okay, from here, now that I've got this comfortable, I'll go to Portuguese. Um, and then that's actually why I decided to learn Esperanto, because I wanted to see that process of learning a language sped up. Um, so um, so I did that to just kind of give myself some more confidence that actually, if I can do these smaller steps, then, you know, I can do bigger ones. So the next one for me will be French to keep in the family, and then I'll move out onto German, and then we can get further filled, like things like, you know, Russian and, and some of the Asian languages. But I've purposefully not moved out of this family, out of this, this um, uh, language family in order to in order to build this confidence. I think if I decided, okay, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna learn Chinese now, I think I would have been really disheartened that I couldn't do it. And I would have ended up back at square one going, oh, like, this is too difficult. You know, I'm not capable of learning foreign languages. Um, so that's been a strategic move, but, um, you know, give me a few years and uh, the, the answer to this question will be different. <clears throat> okay, uh, next question. Uh, any tips for gently encouraging others to speak with you in your target language? Okay, gentle tips I don't have. <laughs> um, um, so, I mean, um, one thing I have done is <clears throat> I remember um, I remember being with actually an, like an, an American, a native, like a, a native, that's a different thing, a native American, uh, a native speaker of English who was from the United States. And, um, and we were both in Spain and they speak Spanish, I speak Spanish, I wanted to improve my Spanish. And, um, and she said to me, um, she said to me, do you speak English? And I said, yeah, I speak English. Um, she said, and then she said, oh, um, oh, I can't remember exactly how the conversation went, but she said, you can speak, in yeah, she said, can you speak English? And I said, yeah, I can, but I don't. <laughs> And she was really quite taken aback by it. But that works because, you know, I told her I can, but that's not how I want this conversation to go. Um, yeah, what I did for a while when I was getting really annoyed with my, my Portuguese friend is I said, right, I am not using English. I put an English ban on myself in November for a, for a month. Uh, and I said, I'm not using English ever with anyone. If you want to talk to me and the only language you speak is English, then get up a translator and we'll do it through a translator. Like I'm only gonna speak in non-English languages. And that was the, the force that my friend needed to say, oh, well, if I want to communicate with her, now I have to do it in Portuguese. 
Um, so, so I don't think it's very easy to change. Um, yeah, I think it's very difficult to to gently to 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 gently get people to change the way that they talk to you. Um, one thing I think is for me, I would call it. Yeah, I think it's kind of like a linguistic etiquette. Is that if somebody speaks to you in one language, to reply to them in the same language, um, because also kind of implicit, especially in environments like you know multilingual environments. It, it, it implicit in that is I want to communicate to you with you in this particular form. So can you please like stay within this form? And so if somebody speaks to me in English, um, if they've started the conversation, I'll reply in English because I think it, it or, you know, the other way around, um, because I think it's really it's quite undermining as well. If you start speaking in you know German and maybe it's not quite perfect. And then a German person res responds to you in English. It's kind of saying, oh, well, you know, your German isn't good enough um, for this conversation. So, yeah. Um, so I think there's, there's the etiquette there um, of, you know, responding to someone in the language that they want to talk to you in. Um, and, then, uh, and then saying to people, yeah, well, I can speak this language, but I won't. Um, which is a lot stronger. And then the final one of, I'm not using English ever for anything. You know, you can speak in whatever language you want, but I will not speak that language. Um, and then people often get the message. All right. <clears throat> and next question. I suspect those who reply in English reduce language to solely a vehicle for transmission of information. So they don't understand. They make you feel like a foreigner or not taken seriously. Your thoughts. I completely agree. I completely agree. And this is why it's so important, I think, to, um, to understand that for um, non-natives, English is almost always um, just seen as this is this international language, you know, as you put it, you know, a vehicle for transmission of information. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's not seen as oh, like I'm, I'm attempting to speak this language. Will you work with me? Will you, you know, take my gesture? Um, that's that's not seen at all. So I think part of the balance here is, you know, giving us compassion by understanding you know, the challenges that we're faced with, but also understanding other people's situation and that they're not, they're not out to get us. Um, even though we, 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 we might feel kind of, we might feel that, you know, attack when that, that German person says, oh, don't bother, you know, they're not saying explicitly, your, your German isn't good enough. They're, they're just trying to make things easier. And I think that makes it easier for us when we're more aware that people, people aren't trying to hold us back actively <laughs> okay uh fourth question may i ask what part of england you're from um yes yes um so um yeah so so i was born in the south i was born in southeast of london um i go to university in the north of of the uk in sheffield but um i i don't know i presume you ask this because of my accent it's the only reason i can think um, my accent has stayed very much um, um, southeast of England and quite um, RP, so very a very standard British accent. <clears throat> uh, question number five. Um, as a tangent, you mentioned Esperanto, which was created to be a universal second language. I'm a native English speaker and was wondering if it is still beneficial to learn Esperanto. <clears throat> beneficial for what? So, so I mean, so yes, I, I speak Esperanto and I chose to learn Esperanto because I saw it as a really useful linguistic tool to help um, build my confidence and knock down this psychological barrier of these struggles um, and, and just and to uh, and to build up a kind of base of vocabulary so that when I started learning other European languages, I would already understand bits of French and bits of German and um, so, um, and some Slavic roots too. Um, so I think it's beneficial in that sense that if you want to learn lots of languages, I think it's a really, it, it, it will help you sharpen the saw before you get shopping on the big languages. <clears throat> uh, and it will also help you with this kind of psychological hurdle if you, if you relate to this and feel it's something you face. Um, in terms of it being useful for international communication, if that's what you mean by beneficial, I I would say that it's 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 not. <laughs> um, I I love I love the idea, the very idealistic, um, you know, um, well, like 
perspective, dream of, of having having Esperanto as our international language, um, I, I think it would be an excellent idea. However, that's not the world we're living in. The world we're living in is, is one where our, our international language is English. Um, and yeah, so, so if you want to learn it um, for international relations, I don't think it's, it's worth it. If you want to learn it because you think it will help you in your kind of in your polyglot ventures, your linguistic ventures, then I definitely think it's worth it. OK, <clears throat> next question. How do you deal with people who are mean or rude about your level in the language? Um, I honestly, I don't deal with very many people who are mean or rude about my level in the language. Um, I think I think anything is kind of it's often very subliminal. So we have this lady in the bar, but she wasn't. We were talking in Spanish, and she wasn't like rude or mean about about uh, anything. She just had this perspective of English people. Um, it was just rude in that sense. Um, but people don't, you know, criticize uh, when I'm speaking in a foreign language. People don't criticize my my level. I think I think we have this idea. Um, well, I certainly, I certainly have had this idea that when you speak to a native speaker of a foreign language, they're going to judge you. But really, it's, I think a lot of them just think, wow, like how brave you are. This is, they see it as like a sign of courage. Um, and so <clears throat> I was in a talk just now. Um, it was, I can't remember. It was, the lady was Yasmin, I think. And she was giving a talk about um, how to have confidence when speaking other languages. And she said, um, speak to people who um, make you forget that you're not fluent in that language. Uh, and I, I really like that. So I think if you seek out, if you seek out friends and people who are supportive, then you know you don't tend to come across people who are mean or rude. Oh, actually, I have one lecturer here at university in Spain who um, I, 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 I mixed up um, something very basic in the language and I, I mixed up uh, the letter V with the letter B or something. And um, he decided to to jump into a um, jump into um, a, using the opportunity in in we were I'm a philosophy student using the class to to teach me the alphabet. He wasn't kidding. He was just being incredibly um, um, I've forgotten the English word. Excellent, incredibly. He was just putting me down. Um, yeah, and and in that environment, I just thought this this you know this is much more a reflection of him than it is of me. This is completely the wrong environment, and so you know I turned around to the rest of the class and I I just said to them with this you know mean and rude person, <laughs> I just said to them, oh welcome everyone to the Spanish class to all these Spanish natives. Um, so I think that's I think that's the only time I've ever had someone being a bit rude. Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't happen much. Um, Oh, I won't have time to answer the questions. Oh, okay, okay. Well, those those last two questions, uh, the questions I haven't answered, um, you can always get in contact with me or email me, and um, um, and yeah, I can I can answer those as well. Um, so yeah, it's been absolutely lovely. Um, I really enjoyed this, and I hope you've enjoyed it too. So just just get in touch if if you'd like to know more. All right, thank you. Bye.